During the past week, I've been helping out a couple who is very interested in purchasing a new EV, and they're doing a lot of due diligence looking at everything from Teslas to Fiskars. And what helping them out has clarified to me in great detail is the fact that electric cars as opposed to gas cars are very different from each other right now. And therefore, as opposed to which gas car you purchase, which really doesn't matter all that much, which electric vehicle you purchase in 2024 makes a huge difference. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. First, a big shout out to Meg and John who are the inspiration for this episode. So thank you so much for making me come along with you as you did all of your due diligence, looking at Teslas, at Fords, at Fiskars, at Rivians, at Volkswagens, at Hyundais, etc. I found it extremely beneficial to have to really think about the advantages and disadvantages of each kind of electric vehicle as I was talking to them. And second of all, before I continue on, definitely check this out. I've got the Year of Embodied AI shirt in the merch store right now. Check out the link. This is the beta copy of the shirt, so it doesn't have 2024 on it, but the version that you get at the merch store says 2024, the year of embodied AI. So your shirt will be even better than mine. So to the topic at hand, first of all, let's discuss why it doesn't really matter what kind of gas car you buy. And believe me, I know there are people who are like Ford to the death or Toyota to the death or whatever, right? People have a lot of brand loyalty. I was super loyal to Mazdas before Teslas came along. But honestly, if you look at gas cars, the difference between one gas car today and another gas car today within a category, right? So if you're looking at an SUV that's like a mid-range that doesn't get extremely good gas mileage or isn't a super sports car or something like that. But within categories, the vehicles are really, really pretty much the same. They're gonna last somewhere on the order of the same amount of miles. They're going to cost more or less the same. So there's not a massive amount of difference between gas cars. And the big reason why is that gas cars have been around for over a hundred years. So over that time, the technology has been refined and refined and refined and car companies that didn't make competitive cars have just gone out of business or been acquired or something like that. And also the technology, the engineering has just gotten really, really good. And the internal combustion engine has been pretty well maximized. So there's just not that much difference between cars. And I know people are already warming up their fingers in the comments to talk to me about how different a Toyota is versus a Ford or something like that. And I do understand that there are still differences, but when it comes down to it, the differences are not really that big. When you turn to EVs, EVs are brand new. Before the late 90s, there really was no modern EV. And yes, I know there were ones in the early 20th century and the early 1900s, but those died off. And so, you know, talking about the modern EVs, which of course were started by the GM EV1, which was the first modern electric vehicle. But of course that vehicle came and went. So really the first kind of mass market electric vehicle, even though it wasn't super mass market, was the Tesla Model S. And that wasn't until about 2012. And so really we're only looking at about a 12 year span between that time and today. And while the back batteries, motors, and all the other technology has advanced very substantially over that time. It's still a baby technology. And that means that there's going to be a really kind of lumpy difference between the way each car company develops their cars. Some cars are going to be much more at the forefront technologically, efficiency-wise, cost-wise, and so forth, whereas other electric vehicles are going to be behind in one or many of those categories. And this is really where Tesla shines when you look at all of these categories. It wins on pretty much everything everything, at least in the North American and European market. I'm not going to really touch on China right now because I don't have good insight into the Chinese electric vehicles. There's just so many out. And since I don't get to drive them or utilize them, I can't really speak to them that well. So I'm pretty much going to talk today to the American and European audience and not to the Chinese audience. And I apologize about that. I just don't know about that. But when it comes to what you can purchase in North America and to a large extent in Europe, even though there are some Chinese cars there, Tesla is by far the winner from the choices that are there in multiple categories. So in addition to being really relatively new, electric vehicles are also fundamentally different in the fact that they're really computers on wheels. They're not a bunch of moving parts that have to work together well, like an internal combustion engine where you slap technology on top of it. I mean, really, if you go back to like the 1960s or 70s, there are still cars that drive perfectly well today that have been maintained over that time, but they still drive well and they have basically no modern technology on them whatsoever, whereas electric vehicles are all about the technology. And of course, Tesla has been doing this for the longest and they're incredibly aggressive in their research and development and technology spend. So they're way out in front in terms of technology in the vehicles themselves. And not only the vehicles themselves, but the factories that manufacture these vehicles, they are very much at the forefront of manufacturing technology. This is something where Tesla has come from way behind. You know, everyone laughed them out of the room in around 2015, 2016, 2018. And now all of a sudden they're like, wow, how do they do this stuff? We've got to copy Tesla. So Tesla has the most advanced technology 
electricity in their cars and also in their factories, which means that relative to the quality of the car and what you get, they sell their cars for the least amount of money of any of the competitors and still make a reasonable profit on it, whereas pretty much everybody else loses money on every EV that they sell. And while the purchase cost might not be as significant a factor as other things, I'm going to turn to a spreadsheet because I love spreadsheets, but we're gonna look at a whole bunch of different factors. So let's look at the purchase price to start with. So the Tesla Model Y long range in the United States with the IRA tax credit, that's a big caveat here, is $42,500. You get a point of sale as long as you make less than $150,000 as an individual or 300,000 as a couple. I think that's the right number. Don't, don't quote me on that, but I, I remember that that's the correct number. Anyway, it's 42, 2,500 to you, whereas a Ford Mustang Mach-E extended range is about 53,000, depending on how you configure it. So that's a difference of 10,500. Now, if you take away the IRA credit, that's only a $3,000 difference. So in Europe or Canada or something like that, the situation might be a little bit different, but still there's a significant cost savings to you as a consumer to purchase a Tesla over another brand. And by the way, I'm just using the Ford Mach-E as the example other car today, because it conveniently just matches up so well with the Model Y. So it's really easy to look across them. Of course, feel free to do comparisons with your version of a car. If you want to do a Lucid Air versus a Model S or a Rivian versus a Cybertruck or whatever, you know, it's fine. I'm just using these two today to make the numbers concrete for at least one example. There are many, many other examples, of course. So again, even without the IRA tax credit, the Tesla Model Y is $3,000 cheaper than the Ford Mach-E and with the tax credit, it's over $10,000 cheaper. And don't forget that Tesla is making money on these while Ford is losing a ton of money for every Mach-E that they sell. So that's kind of an unsustainable business on Ford's part, whereas Tesla can keep doing this for years and make good money out of it. Okay, so price difference is the relatively easy thing to compare. Let's get into the weeds a little bit here. Let's start talking about efficiency. So the battery for a Tesla Model Y long range has about 75 kilowatts of usable battery space, and the batteries are bigger than what you actually see in the usability stuff, but that doesn't really matter. For the purposes of this comparison, let's just use the usable space, which is around 75 kilowatt hours. In comparison, the Ford Mach-E extended range is 91 kilowatt hours. And for the 75 kilowatt hours or 91 kilowatt hours, with the Tesla, you get 310 miles of adjusted EPA range. It used to be about 330, but the EPA changed all of their rating systems and stuff. Anyway, but with that new rating system, you get 310 ostensible miles, which is actually closer to the real mileage that you actually get. So I'm not complaining. But the Ford Mach-E in comparison is 290 miles, or you get 20 miles more range with the Tesla Model Y than you do with the Ford Mustang Mach-E extended range. And this, of course, is with the two motor version. If we want to look at the one motor version, interestingly enough, we just got the one motor extended range version introduced in Europe. So that's rather convenient. You can't really buy this version in the United States right now, but I just kind of wanted to do an apples to apples comparison. Anyway, it gets 600 kilometers of WLTP range. So I had to adjust it down because that's about 374 miles, but WLTP is notoriously bad. So I guesstimated the single motor long range version of the Model Y would get about 350 miles of EPA range. Whereas we know the Ford Mustang Mach-E single motor extended range gets 310 miles. So anyway, it's somewhere around 40 miles of difference. That's not quite as good a comparison since I don't have exact numbers for that, but it's still a useful comparison. Where things get really interesting is when we look at efficiency. So if we look at the efficiency for the two motor Tesla long range, it's 4.1 miles per kilowatt hour. So basically you take 310 miles. So to do this calculation, just take 310 10 miles and divide it by 75 kilowatts. So to do this calculation for the Tesla, just take 310 miles range, divide it by 75 kilowatt hours, you get 4.1 miles per kilowatt hour. Do the same thing for the Ford Mustang Mach-E, you get 3.2 miles per kilowatt hour. In other words, Tesla has about a 28% advantage for efficiency. If we do the same thing for the single motor version, you can see approximately 4.7 miles per kilowatt hour versus 3.4 miles per kilowatt hour, or a 37% efficiency advantage in favor of the Tesla. And finally, let's get to the bottom line here. How much of a cost difference does this make to you? So if we arbitrarily say you're going to spend 20 cents per kilowatt hour on electricity, and I know that's highly variable, but I'm just throwing out a number here, make it higher or lower, you can calculate it yourself. And you drive 15,000 miles for five years or 75,000 miles, the dual motor Model Y is going to cost you about 36.59 to charge up over that amount of time, whereas the Ford Mustang Mach-E is going to cost you about 46.88 or a difference of around $1,000. So of course, that's amortized over five years, but that's still about $200 a year difference just in charging costs. So that's not nothing. And if your electricity costs you more than that, then the difference is going to increase and increase 
increase and increase. If we look instead at the single motor variants, you can see that the Model Y is gonna cost you about $31.91 to charge up over five years, whereas the Ford Mach-E is gonna cost you about $44.11 or a difference of around $1,200. So it's even more for the single motor versions instead. So this efficiency really does affect your wallet. It costs you more every single year to charge up the Ford Mustang Mach-E than it does to charge the Tesla, assuming you drive the exact same number of miles. And speaking of affecting the bottom line, this time in terms of time, if you're thinking about max charge speed for these two different vehicles, the Tesla Model Y long range maxes out at 250 kilowatts, whereas the Ford Mustang Mach-E maxes out at 150 kilowatts. So if you wanna charge from 10 to 80%, it's gonna take you around 27 minutes with a Tesla Model Y long range, whereas it'll take you 38 minutes with a Ford Mustang Mach-E extended range. And that's a difference of 41%. So normally speaking, if you're charging it at home overnight and stuff, it's not going to matter that much because you just plug it in and forget about it. But if you're on a road trip, 41% more time sitting at the charger waiting for it to charge is a big deal. You're going to want the most efficient charging if you're driving an electric vehicle and that extra 11 minutes per charge is going to add up really, really fast on a long road trip. And speaking of fast charging and road trips, let's not forget the fact that Tesla has access to the full Tesla supercharging network. That is a big advantage. It also uses the North American charging standard or NACS to do the charging, which of course Tesla created and is now the standard in the United States and Canada, and I believe in Mexico as well. And currently every other automobile sold in the United States in 2024 uses the CCS standard instead, and they're all going to have to get adapters in order to use Tesla superchargers this year. And even more importantly, Importantly, all the manufacturers next year, 2025 into 2026, are going to shift over to NACS as well, which means if you purchase an electric vehicle that is not a Tesla this year, you're going to be stuck with a legacy and much more awkward and bulky charging standard, and you're going to have to use adapters anywhere you go, and it's going to be really annoying. And that makes a really big difference in your user experience, right? This is something that over time will get resolved, and every automobile manufacturer that makes EVs in North America will use NACS. It looks like there's still a couple of small holdouts, but basically they'll all use that over time. But right now, that is a really big difference between these vehicles. Next up, let's talk about technology in cars. Tesla has a ton of technology in their vehicles. They have a minimalist interface, which mostly depends on the screen. You might or might not like that, but I kind of compare it to like smartwatches versus an old Casio watch. You know, the old Casios where you had to push like the different buttons and combinations just to set the time and everything, and you could never remember how to do it. And it was really awkward and annoying. And now with smartwatches, and especially if you hook them up to your smartphone, you've got something that's really, really easy to control. And it does way more than the old Casio watches. Likewise, Tesla's interface does a ton more than the older interfaces. A lot of people who haven't driven a Tesla complain that Tesla doesn't have CarPlay or Android Auto. I actually complained about that before I purchased the Tesla. I was like, ah, surely they need to put Apple CarPlay in it so I can use my iPhone with it. But now I wouldn't want to go back to that. CarPlay, when I get into a vehicle that uses CarPlay, play, it looks incredibly primitive. Because remember, they have to design it for small displays, very primitive displays. So it's a really primitive interface compared with the amazing technology that's built into the UI and the interface that Teslas have. So while personal tastes might vary and you might decide that you want a whole bunch of buttons and some other kind of interface, I personally believe, and I think it's backed up by smartphones and smartwatches, that people generally like the kind of blank slate look and the ability for the interface to change itself over time. And speaking of the interface changing itself over time, that brings us to over-the-air updates. Tesla and really I think Rivian is the only other company that really does this right now, but they do over-the-air updates so every few weeks your car is a new car. It's really cool. You get new features, you get a whole bunch of things. In one of the last revisions, Tesla added a feature where the car reminds you at night if you're at home and your car is not plugged in, it'll be like, hey, you're, you know, your battery's at only 35%. Maybe you want to plug it in overnight and charge it up. That's really, really cool. And that's just a feature that wasn't there a few weeks ago. So over-the-air updates are a huge advantage that Tesla has. And while we're on that subject, let's bring up the Tesla app. This thing is really awesome. It allows you to walk up to your car and the car unlocks. You can drive the car without a key. It operates operates pretty much all of the controls remotely. You can decide to do over-the-air updates. You're in bed at night. You're like, oh, there's an over-the-air update. You just push the button. You go to sleep. You don't even worry about it. You don't even have to go to your car. So it does a ton of stuff 
for you on the app, keeps track of things. If there's ever a need for service or anything, or even like rotating the tires or something, just go into the app, select service, say, I want to do a tire rotation, set it all up. It's, it's all super, super easy. So I think a lot of people underestimate the importance of the app and how wonderful it is to have the app working with your car. Just the unlock and drive feature alone so that you don't have to carry keys around is amazing. And then of course, let's talk safety and autonomy. Tesla is so far ahead of every other vehicle manufacturer in terms of autonomy, it's not even funny. If you haven't driven Tesla's full self-driving version 12, Go to a Tesla showroom, have them do a demo drive. They'll be happy to do that for you. You will be blown away by what this thing can do. But even if you don't want to spring for full, full self-driving, you can still use autopilot and autopilot does a ton of stuff for you automatically as well. It does lane keeping. It does traffic aware cruise control. It's really excellent. And even the basic autopilot takes a huge load off you as the driver. And as it turns out, you might be able to utilize your car someday as a robo taxi, which could either transport you from point to point without you having to pay attention. And that has its own advantages, but even more awesome would be if Tesla creates a fleet of these and you can attach your car to that and it can go out and drive around when you're at work or something and it can earn you money while you're sitting in your office working. That would be pretty darn amazing. So that of course is speculative, that's not true yet, but Tesla is the only company where that's a realistic possibility of that happening because they built all of this hardware into every vehicle since about 2018. And of course related to that is Tesla's renown for safety. If we look at this chart here from Tesla's impact report, you can see miles driven per one accident and they've got in the deep blue is Tesla vehicles using autopilot, which is autopilot or full self-driving. In the light blue, they have Tesla vehicles not using autopilot technology. And in other words, you, the human is driving it. And then you have the US average of people just driving in whatever cars. So you can see here that Tesla's with autopilot averaged, you know, over the past several quarters, somewhere between five and six million miles for one accident. They drive a long, long ways. Without autopilot, it goes down quite a bit. So if you have a Tesla, you should definitely use autopilot or full self-driving as much as possible because you can see how much safer it is. But even without that, it's somewhere between one and one and a half million miles, depending on the quarter. And then of course, if you look at the gray bar, which is the US you know, average of just regular drivers, you can see that that's about 500,000 miles between accidents. So what does this tell us? This tells us that Tesla's, even with humans driving, are two to three times safer than just the US fleet average. And if you include their automated safety technology, their autopilot or full self-driving, they're 10 to 12 times safer than humans driving. That is pretty remarkable. And if safety is any kind of concern to you or your family, that should be a big determining factor in which car you pick because <laughs> you want a car that's not gonna get into accidents all that frequently. And related to that, if the car does get into an accident, Tesla Model 3, Y, S, and X have all been rated amongst or the very top rated safety vehicle that's ever been rated by many testing facilities around the globe. So first of all, the Tesla is much less likely to get into an accident. And second of all, if it does, it's incredibly safe. My good friend Gail in Texas, her husband just got into a terrible accident where a drunk driver went through a red light, just completely smashed their car up. And even though the car was completely demolished, he was fine. And that's just, it's amazing. You know, what kind of price can you put on not only your life, but your health as well? well. You don't want to get into an accident, but if you do, you want to be in the safest car possible. And Teslas really are the safest cars that you can buy. And moving away from your safety to the safety of the car company, a big question you should ask yourself about electric vehicle manufacturers is, will they be around in one year, in three years, in five? Meg and John specifically asked me about the Fisker Ocean while they were doing their due diligence. And I was like, yeah, pretty cool car, but I don't think the company is even going to be around in 12 months. So that's a scary proposition. Do you really really want to buy a piece of technology, especially a you know relatively young model in terms of the production number and have the company go out of business and not be able to get service for it in one or two years when you have a service need. So you really do need to take that into account. The solvency of the company itself, you should look into as you're purchasing an electric vehicle. And finally, if you care at all about reselling the car after you purchase it, you should look at resale values. The Tesla Model Y, for example, holds its value very well. On CarMax, I can see 
see that a 2022 Model Y with 29,000 miles on it still sells for $40,000. And of course, if you look at the new car price, the new car price with the IRA tax credit is only $42,500. So that car is selling pretty close to what the new car is with the IRA tax credit. So that means that the Tesla is holding its value very well for an electric vehicle. And that is another thing that you should consider as you consider purchasing a new car, because someday you are going to want to sell it and you're not going to want to lose all your money when you do so. So that is a lot of reasons that I think that the Tesla is by far the best electric vehicle choice you can purchase in North America or Europe. Again, as opposed to gas cars, where I really don't think it matters that much what brand you purchase with electric vehicles and how young they are and how different they are in their technology and their safety and their resale value, et cetera, et cetera. It makes a big difference which electric vehicle you purchase. And looking at the data, I have to come down on the side of Tesla. It is just the best vehicle to purchase in the electric vehicle space. All right, so those are my thoughts. Let me know what you think in the comments. And while you're down there, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. And of course, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.